thank you for having me again. It's been a long time, it feels like, since I've done a webinar for Corel, but um, that doesn't mean I have uh, stopped using the software. Um, in addition to, like Tanya said, in addition to sculpting, um, I do a lot of work for um, film posters and toy packaging and thing like that, things like that. And I only really kind of exclusively use uh, Corel Painter. Uh, and the reason for that is because it just has a more natural look to me and uh, you see the strokes and all that. So if you guys can see my screen, um, you can see that I have a Spider-Man here that I did for Upper Deck uh, trading cards. And over here, I have the actual uh, cards that they sent me to, uh, these I guess are like the chase cards that are the signed ones I sent back. Um, on the bottom, there is Anti-Venom. Um, I kind of am into the whole Spider-Verse thing now, uh, especially since I saw the Spider-Verse movie and kind of fell in love with it. So I've been doing a lot of Spider-Man stuff. Um, this is that uh, Anti-Venom painting, again, done with Corel. Uh, painter, and if you zoom in, you can see all the really nice kind of uh, brush strokes and everything that I kind of uh, have, you know, grown to love with uh, Corel Painter. So today I thought it would be fun to do a uh, webinar of um, Venom Pool. Um, we have the new Venom 2 movie being worked on now, and of course Deadpool is a big favorite for, for, uh, for me and a lot of people. So I decided to do this Venom Pool character. Uh, I think he came out of the Marvel Contest of Champions game. Um, and this is kind of what he looks like in the game. There's been some cool sculpts of him and toys. And, uh, and so I thought it would be cool to take a project I did before, which was this piece here, uh, the white one. Um, I did that for Pixelogic. Uh, it's on my sculpts. Uh, bah, 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 bah. Okay, all right, so I guess that's the one I have. But anyway, I did that for Pixelogic as a sculpt, and I thought it would be cool to repurpose him and turn him into uh, Venom Pool. Okay, so level of detail that I want on this guy is this level. Um, I did this piece a while ago, um, also with Corel Painter. All right, so that's enough talking. Let's stop all this jibber jabber uh, and get to the thing. Okay, this program I have sitting here is called Pure Ref, P-U-R-R-E-F. It is a, um, it's a ref, uh, it's a, it's a piece of software you can download for free and then donate to them, but it keeps all of your images on top. And if I go to Painter here, um, okay, this is the sketch that I did based on this angle, okay? So I took him. Uh, one of the things I do a lot is, like I said, toy art for like Hasbro. Um, I'm working on GI Joes. And what I'll do is I will take um, 3D assets like the toy and kind of pose them the way that I want and then use that as a base to save me time. I'm gonna spend a lot of time on the paint, so I wanna move through the drawing as soon as possible. Um, so what I have done is did this drawing here of our guy. Uh, I'm going to turn down, and this is my normal workflow, so um, I'll go to the line part here and fill it with a color that I'll be able to see. So something like this light blue. And I did that because I have preserved transparency turned on, right? Now I can turn down the line and I can go to a darker background like this, okay? Um, I just want to be able to barely see it. And I also made a layer. This is the most prepared I've ever been for a webinar, I think, um, Tanya. I, I went and made all my colors here that I want to use and labeled them. And so now I can start painting. I love it, Mike. Uh, so it's awesome. A layer. <laughs> and get my trusty scratch board tool. We have some brushes coming out. I think uh, I did some brushes for Corel where these are all my favorite brushes and um, and the scratch board is in there. That's kind of the one I use for most of my stuff. All right, so I'm just gonna test around. One thing that I love to do right off the back is do the brush tracking and make sure that I would lay down a few strokes just so it feels good. 
All right, so let's actually turn let's a little more pressure. And this is one of those things where I have to do it a couple times, but when I get it, I am golden. All right, cool. So now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start blocking in some of these colors really quickly. And it's always messy when I start off. So, Tanya, if there are any questions, you can you can ask while I'm doing this. Marsha said that she has Pureff as well, and she's wondering if you can use an eyedropper on that to get color in Painter. Um, I don't think so. I don't know. I haven't. You know, I feel like I tried it and maybe it didn't work, but. Um, I'm not going to say a definite no. I'm not sure on that one. You know what? I Yeah, I'm not sure either. Um, I can try and do a little test behind the scenes because if the eyedropper works outside of Painter, then it should work in that. But yeah, I yeah. don't know that you can sample from the desktop with our eyedropper. I should yeah, know. Yeah, I think so. Um, let's see. Do you mix colors in Painter? Or do you just pick the color from the color picker? Um, I've been doing color picker lately. Um, I definitely have a palette that I made a while ago that I use from time to time. But lately, I've just been using the, the, the temporal color palette and just dragging and picking colors I want. OK. Yeah. And as far as your brushes, thank you for mentioning that. They are not available quite yet, but towards the end of the month, we'll be releasing your brush pack. Okay. And anybody that's using Painter will get a notification about that. So coming yes. soon. Exciting. Coming soon. Yeah. And I also didn't tell everybody that we are recording the session. So we'll post this up by this evening takes a little while to process, but if you have to go for any reason, no worries. You can watch it later. Nice. What tablet are you using today? Uh, this is the Cintiq 32-inch uh, Pro. Okay. Nice. Yeah. So I'm actually also a... Um, uh, I have a relationship with Wacom, um, and they send me stuff to test and use... I um, actually went on a speaking tour for them last year to South America. So I've always used their products. I'm a big fan. Oh, one of the attendees said, no, you cannot sample with the eyedropper and Pure can't, F. can't do it. Okay. No. I feel like I tried it and I also found that out, but yeah. Thank you, Carl. I think that's how you pronounce your name. Sorry if I messed it up now <laughs> the copy did. did you you just hand wrote all the copy that's underneath your swatches right yeah yeah I just used my, my pencil and and wrote that in there just to help me remember because I know that you know I I can get sidetracked and I wanted to be able to move really quickly one of the things we always do is run out of time for these and in fact I've gotten you know I know people on YouTube that like, why don't you draw the thing when you do the webinar? It's because it just kind of takes away from the painting time, you know? Well, it's, it's pretty difficult to paint and talk at the same time and explain things. Yeah. <laughs> so well, yeah. And an hour is not that much time. It's not as long as you might think. So I completely not. understand. Yeah, it's definitely not. So I, I have an idea of what I want to do here. Um, part of the great thing about um, sculpting these things first and then looking at them is that you can get a, a better idea for volume. And in fact, using like using Corel and uh, ZBrush was was something that kind of came out of necessity. Um, when I was working on things for games and 
you know, uh, like video games and, and box art and stuff like that, I would always need reference and I would never have the perfect reference. So what I ended up doing was I would go online and grab a bunch of um, images off of like Google and then Frankenstein them together. And more often than not, it turned into be more of a problem because the light source was all over the place, you know. Um, and so what I ended up doing was um, sculpting my own guys and, uh, and then I can pose them and light them and rotate them however I want and get the perfect reference every time. So it does take more time, but it just, in the end, it saves time. So that's my workflow now. So I'm doing is just scribbling in some of these colors, uh, you know, the values and the colors that I want for, um, for this piece. If you're wondering, everything always starts off super messy. Like I really don't care. And in fact, I like to keep, um, some of these, you know, these strokes and these messy areas. I don't do a lot of smoothing. Uh, only because I started as a traditional artist. I've been painting for more years than I want to admit. Um, and uh, and what I find is I'm not a fan of, in my own work anyway, I'm not a fan of things that are too clean and too, you know, too airbrushy looking, too sterile is kind of what I like to call it. Um, there are some really awesome pieces out there that are very smooth, but that's just not my thing. Jose is wondering how you're switching between the eyedropper and the brush. Okay, so on my um, on my stylus, my Wacom stylus, I have a uh the front button i'm using the 3d stylus actually so there's the toggle switch in addition to a front button um so there's three buttons on here no eraser and what that allows me to do is i designated that front button as the eyedropper and the alt key is the quick key everybody um alt or option depending yeah. upon what platform you're on Yep. And you should just be able to quickly switch using that. Click the B key to get back to the brush. Yep. Becca is asking what your favorite brushes are, but I have a feeling that you'll be, um, as we go along here, they're all in your your custom brush palette there. So Yeah, <laughs> um, they are. Yeah, you will I cover that. You, the, the, the scratch board tool is basically a modified scratch board tool um that i've been using for years and it's just it's just my favorite brush of all time it's kind of a uh, swiss army knife for me because it's so versatile and i use it for everything really um big fan of of uh, the scratch board now do you ever there was a question just saying could you review for me how you selected those colors did you sure. just take on the color wheel to the um, the canvas itself, and do you ever add them to a mixer? See, I could. The, the, I end up having to really move stuff fast, so I don't have a whole lot of time to um, organize like that. If it's something that I'm going to reuse over and over again, like say I'm working on something for G.I. Joe, and it has a particular uh, color palette, that I know I'm going to use again and again. If that's the case, I'm definitely going to go in and uh, and make a mixer and keep those, you know, keep those handy. But more often than not, I'm doing stuff for movie posters that are really kind of churn and burn, where they need them in a couple days. So I'll just go in and and eyeball it and use it the one time. Um, I may not necessarily come back to it again. Uh, 
everything is in the interest of saving time. Like I really don't, as a you know, as a professional illustrator, I don't have a whole lot of time to to waste. So anything that saves me time, I I'm all about it. Do you have any advice for be artists to get the hang of things? I'm sorry, I heard advice and then it kind of cut out a little bit. What'd you say? For just a beginner painter artist to get started. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would basically say that, and I, I say this for painters and sculptors, and pretty much applies to anybody, um, is find somebody that you like their style and um, kind of just mimic that for a while until you get comfortable. And then you start introducing other things into it to make it your own style. So like when I began uh, as an artist, like one of the hardest things I ever did was trying to establish my own style. I just didn't know what to do and I was worried because I wanted somebody to see something of mine and say, oh, Mike did it. Um, and that's really like, aside from charging what you're worth, that's that was the biggest hurdle for me to overcome. Um, so what I ended up doing was looking at a lot of artists who I really enjoyed and, uh, you know, people like Norman Rockwell or Ernie Barnes, um, and like, you know, contemporary guys like Alex Ross, uh, and other comic book illustrators. And, um, and I would try to do what they do. You know, I would try to make my stuff look like theirs. And then after a while, I realized I was taking those styles and kind of merging them all together and mashing them up and um, and then doing my own thing. And before long, that became my look. So I would just say that, you know, at the beginning, it's not cheating if you are looking at somebody's stuff that you admire and, and you know, for lack of a better term, aping that for a little while uh, until you get comfortable with doing your own thing. Just want to let you know that um, Carl said, I think I found somebody who I want to learn from. That would yeah, be nice. you, Mike. <laughs> nice. Thank you. Thank you. And I may, I obviously missed this as well. Um, sorry, I'm going back through the questions here. Um, no worries. Did you turn the, the black outline to blue? I did. Yeah, I did. And that's only so I can see it. So what's going to happen is once I block these colors in, I'm going to turn it off altogether. But for now, I'm able to turn it down low enough where I can see it. If it was white, it would be a little too much. But now, like, I can turn it down, get a good idea, and then, you know, turn it off from time to time. And you can see they're starting to come together, right? Like, it's it's always going to be what's super messy like this. But, yeah. Was it said? just the opacity slider that you used, or did you actually... No, no, no. It started off as black, and then I turned on preserved transparency and filled okay. it with a light blue. Okay. Thank you. Uh-huh. What size and resolution is this image, and what do you typically recommend working at? Sure. So because I work for stuff that is going to be used usually for print in some fashion. Um, 300 DPI is usually the end goal, unless it's something that might be huge. Um, so perfect example of that, like I did a roadblock for um, Hasbro's relaunch of G.I. Joe, and that was going to be used for a banner. So the piece I was using, I was working 600 DPI instead of 300. And then they made that really big and had it at the toy fair as like a, a big banner or whatever. Um, normally, I'll work at 200. And then at the end, I scale up the uh, I scale up the piece to um, to to 300 when it's done. One thing Painter does that I really like is it will size up the uh, the piece without really um, pixelating it. So I, I dig that. I, I seem to have better luck with with Corel than I do with Painter when I do that. But I don't know. Maybe I'm just imagining it. Um, you mean the other P product? The one that the the the, the Voldemort. He shall the, who shall not be named. 
that other no thing. no you said painter instead of i think you meant photoshop. oh the other thing the other thing the other one you know the one yeah okay i thought i slipped up and said it we don't say that here <laughs> Yeah, Do you no, have any recommendations for, well, somebody had asked, um, are you observing yourself or once you've got the sketch, you're just working from that? Am I observing what now? Your sculpt. Like, do you have um, anything anywhere? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I, yeah, absolutely. So I, I have this open in the other screen, right? And then I also kind of look at, this is another one I did. So I look at these kind of things together and I see how I want this to be lit. So like this started off as a sculpt right here and then I, I added color to it and rendered it and it looks like a toy right now or a sculpture or whatever. So that's, that's what I'm using in the second screen. I have two monitors by the way, so that's why I'm able to move it off screen and, and still be able to paint. Okay. Thanks for clarifying because there were a few questions. It's a little confusing. We couldn't see it. I know, I know. Magic. <laughs> um, let's see. Alan wants to know if you use Painter exclusively or do you use other software from time to time? Um, I bounce back and forth a lot, actually. I mean, since, what was it? 2016 actually before that like whatever x was it x3 was that a version one of them started yeah. like yeah the color profile started playing really well with uh with other with other you know more um maybe more mainstream apps and um and so once that happened i i bounced back and forth so i might do Actually, I do do all of my painting here in Painter, and then I'll bounce over to you know Photoshop and do color correction or whatever, and and give that to the client. Um, I know I can do those things in here, but I'm more comfortable just painting in here, and doing things like using Liquify or whatever um, in the other app to to make corrections later on or adjustments. But I do go back and forth like all the time. And I think it's a fairly common process. You know, most of our artists have Photoshop and Painter, and it's common that they will go into Photoshop to do things like you said, you know, yeah. liquefy or to finalize the image for print. Yeah, exactly. Every once in a while, my um, I start having issues with the pin, so I have to recalibrate. There it is. Okay, I lost my eyedropper for a minute there. That would have taken a lot of time, so I got it back. Joanne's wondering why you work at 200 DPI and then scale up to 300. Uh, because I tend to use a lot of layers. Like right now, I'm only on the one layer, but I will eventually get multiple layers so I don't have to worry about messing up and you know, um, losing something I really like. So because of that, um, you know, the scale of this, I, I didn't even mention, by the way, I think the scale of this is like 16 inches wide. So if I was at 300 DPI, 16 inches wide, and I get like, you know, 15, 20 layers, it starts to drag a little bit. Uh, so that's why I do it. What What did you create that sculpt in? I'm sorry, say again? The um, sculpt that you're using as reference, what uh -huh. program do you create that in? Oh, oh, that's done in ZBrush, Pixelogic okay. ZBrush. So I also do webinars for them. Um, not webinars, I'm sorry. I do uh, live streams for them twice a month. So I go on there and kind of just work on stuff and play around. I'm working right now on a, this Hulk that I sculpted that I'm doing a full size, not full size, I'm doing a very large print of. Um, when it's done, it's going to be, I think, two feet tall. So that's what I've been working on. And in fact, it's funny because my the name of my 
stream for them is illustration by way of uh, ZBrush. So because it's part of my workflow, I bounce back and forth between Corel Painter and uh, and ZBrush. Uh, I, it's good to have two platforms to kind of talk about. So the good thing about this is once I get these colors laid in, I can kind of just eye drop from the screen rather than having to go over to my swatches. I like that a lot. It saves time again. Start getting some toning over here. Jason is wondering if you always end up meshing colors on an individual layer. And specifically, I guess he's wondering, you know, if you have to edit in Photoshop mm -hmm. um, and you had multiple layers. Mm -hmm. He's saying, since the colors are combined in one layer and can't be edited, oh, because if they're all on one layer, you couldn't edit them separately in Photoshop. Uh, yeah, and normally I don't do that. What I'll do is I will be completely on board with what I've done on a layer before I combine it with another layer. Um, I just, I don't want to take any chances. And I even do like iterative saves. So if there's something where I have an idea that this might be something that I need to come back to, um, I'll save it as, like right now this is uh, Venom Pool Paint working I would save like, you know, 0.1 and, you know, keep going up the list like that. Uh, so, and for a client, I generally don't worry about um, saving space until it becomes necessary. Like right now, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to have a pretty, a pretty decent rig right now. Um, so I don't really run out of space. Uh, you know, if I did, I would I would flatten flatten things. There's a few people asking if you use any other Corel products like Draw or Corel Photo Paint or anything like that. When I started way back in the day, like a long time ago, I used to use Corel draw like that's what i learned digital painting on or drawing on rather um and at that time like i'm just giving you a disclaimer i'm a pretty old dude i don't look like it but at that time it was amazing to me that you could do stuff on a computer so um that's that's kind of where i started then later on i got introduced to adobe only because when i was working that was what everybody used. Um, I was in the graphic design industry and the clothing industry. And um, so I moved to that for a while. Also, I was on a Mac for a long time and um, exclusively. And so that was just my kind of my go to. I found my way back to Corel. Um, you know, I don't know how long we've been kind of working together, Tanya. It's been a lot a while. Um, I want to say six, seven years. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Do you ever bring your ZBrush renders into Painter and paint on top of them? Um, I do. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I do. So there is uh, there's a client that I work with a lot. And the turn time for their their stuff is super tight. Like there's a guy I'm working on right now that uh, I only had really two days to get them together. And so I had them give me the toy. And I, you know, it's just an action figure. And I posed him to be this dynamic pose. And then, um, and then I kind of lit him and I 
painted them in in ZBrush and lit them and did a render. And the render looks okay, but you know, obviously it looks like a toy. So then I'll take that and I'll paint over it in in Painter. And uh, by the time I'm done, it looks like that Spider-Man piece that you were looking like looking at, or the you know the Ninja Turtle. How did you get started and you know become recognized in the business? Like if you're new and you'd love to do packaging illustration, uh -huh. how would you recommend getting started and finding people who would hire you? Sure. So I kind of forced my way into the business um, when I was I was doing T-shirts for a really long time. And uh, the company I was with was a young man's brand, a young men's brand um, called Echo. And so I did a lot of hip hop stuff. I know I enjoyed it, but I wanted to do all the nerdy stuff that I enjoyed, like video game covers and toy packaging and all that. Uh, so I just kind of started branching out and doing stuff for magazines, little spot illustrations here and there. Uh, that turned into um, that turned into half pages and then eventually full page uh, illustrations. And once that was done, I established my style and the fact that uh, I had a good work ethic. Like that's one thing that art directors love is somebody who can meet their deadlines and turn things in in time and also be really consistent with their work. Like that's that's the main thing. I was talking to the students in uh, in South America, and that's one thing I, I love to tell them is that you know it's more important to have a really strong body of work than to uh, than to have just a whole bunch of you know different stuff in your portfolio, right? Um, when people are going to hire you, they want something that looks a way that they can reproduce and and they'll go to you for a certain style uh so that's what i did and i took my portfolio around and i showed it and i got you know i got some rejection uh eventually i started getting people who would hit me up and now i have on the west coast uh there's a company i work with that does these movie posters and um and they reach out to me for a job because they you know they know what they can expect. One of those Cleos you were talking about was for the movie Deadpool 2. And uh, I did a piece that they used on a billboard, which was, uh, it was these fingernails. And on the fingernails, uh, there were paintings, little emojis of Deadpool and Cable and, and all those guys. And that was a really kind of fun piece because I had my daughter at the time posed for, she's still my daughter, by the way, at the time she posed for me and uh, um, with her fingernails. And I just kind of took a digital picture of them and then painted on the, uh, the characters. And that got selected as like one of the advertisement um, pieces of the year, which was pretty fun. When you're doing something like packaging design for the toy makers, do you, uh, do you actually look at the, the model? Do they send you an example to work from or you recreate it in ZBrush and use that? How does that work? So it's, it's different for different people, um, but the one I just mentioned has a deco that they'll give to me, which is basically just a, a sheet with the turnaround of the character and call outs of the materials that they're, you know, that they want this thing to be matte. They want this thing to be shiny. Um, and, uh, and then the colors that they're interested in and I'll paint, um, based on that. Uh, they also happen to have the, the actual action figures that they can send me. And because I'm using ZBrush, I can take those action figures and bring them in. They're usually a whole bunch of parts. So, you know, every piece on there that's articulated, if it has 20 p points of movement, there's 20 separate pieces, you know, shoulder, arm, forearm, whatever. 
I'll take those pieces and kind of put them back together again and then uh, and then I'll pose them and light them and and use that but it's not always like that you know like I just did a piece for Hanna-Barbera where I had to go and work on a lot of you know like Scooby-Doo and Muttley and all those guys and I had to uh, they didn't have any of that stuff so I had to kind of recreate you know the the Flintstones car and the the Jetsons ship and all that stuff myself and uh and then light it and use that as reference for the painting thank you mm -hmm. Peggy's wondering if there's anything special you need to do to prep a t-shirt rendering for a t-shirt yeah um yeah well if i mean at the time i was doing the separations for the t-shirts so basically that meant that i had to do the artwork and then turn around and do what's called separation which is separate the colors for the printer to actually print them on a uh people call it silk screen but like screen print them um so that was you know that took more time than the artwork itself basically but um, yeah, that's the only real prep that's involved with t-shirts that's different from, you know, just doing anything the way you normally would. Leon's making a very good point. Painter has a lot of brushes and settings. How did you go about evaluating the brushes and the, get to this core set of brushes that of? Sure. So when I first started using Painter, it's really funny. Um, I had to, I had to use it. I, I had owned every version of Painter before that, but I just didn't take the time to learn them because I knew Photoshop and it was comfortable and that was what, you know, people were using. And so I didn't even appreciate what I had until one day, I think uh, Apple came out with an update for their OS and it broke it broke paint, um, it broke Photoshop for me. I couldn't use it. I had a super tight deadline that was due. Um, so I opened up Painter and the first thing I noticed was there's all these options and it quite frankly really scared me. Um, it was like looking at the, you know, the control panel of a, of a 747. So one thing that I did, you know, when I first started working with you guys was come out with an interface that turns off all the stuff that I probably wouldn't use and just kept um, the things that I would use. Uh, so the only way I was able to learn was by using one brush at a time and turning off everything else um, and just kind of becoming comfortable with it or realizing, you know, this isn't really something that I would do in outside of the computer. That, that was my main thing. I wanted brushes that felt like the way that I worked when I was working traditionally on cold press illustration board. And so that was, um, that was what I did, you know, just worked with them until I figured out what worked and what didn't work for me. And eventually I had this, you know, set of brushes that you see right here on my screen. But it's funny, if I hadn't had that problem with the computer, I never really would have probably used it. I have all these applications I buy that are, you know, people are talking about how great they are, and then they just kind of sit there because I don't have time to learn them. Um, so I'm kind of glad that I had problems that day, actually. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> Can you refresh our memory? I'm sure you said this already, but how... Do you have the tablet set up for your pen to change the size of the brush? I do. So the, like I said, it has three buttons on here. The front toggle, if I hold it and drag, sizes up. The, uh, the front button does the eyedropper and the back toggle turns on and off the temporal color picker. So, and it does it wherever I am. So that's nice. These are the things I use the most. So I was really, happy to get those uh, front and center on my interface here.
So once I start to get uh, this stuff knocked in, I don't want to, the other thing you'll notice is I am not working an area to completion. Um, I notice that I work much faster in everything. If I work an area to a certain level and then move on and work another piece until the whole piece is at, you know, the same level of, of, of definition. Then once that's done, I'll make a new layer and I'll start working up details. Um, so I'm kind of getting close to that point right now. I see that I have some stuff that I've just neglected altogether. So I'm just going to block those in too. And the idea for this guy, if you're not, you know, following any of my Pixelogic stuff, is that it is uh, nerd alert. This is a symbiote, so from Spider-Man, and his thing is he can turn into this kind of uh, this goo and come out of things. Um, and so that's I had to do a, a challenge for them where I had just a sphere and turn it into a sculpture with no extra parts, and that's what this was. So he's coming out of a ball here. You're gonna be like, why is he coming out of a ball? That's why. This is a good question. Do you use cotton gloves or a smudge guard while you're I'm using? using yeah, I'm using a smudge guard right now. Um, I really like it because working on a Cintiq, I notice the screen is kind of warm and my palm will start to get a little moist and it drags on the screen. So in addition to keeping me from having fingerprints, uh, my hand doesn't get hot really if I'm wearing this glove. But yeah, I, I'm using the smudge guard. The, the woman that makes those is really nice by the way. So I've stuck with her brand forever. Like I reached out to her and she like, you know, answered back and everything. So yeah, that's what I use. What's the name? Uh, the name of the product? Yeah, is it just called Smudge Guard? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Smudge Guard oh. Club. Yeah. So it has um, basically it. Uh, I got I have the one finger version. So imagine uh, like a a neoprene glove where all of my my thumb and four fingers are cut out, and the only thing that's covered is my pinky and my wrist my palm rather. So that's what that's what that is. And you have to remind me again, what size is your Cintiq mark? Oh, the Cintiq one? is a, yeah, Cintiq is a 32 inch, the 32, 32 inch pro. Okay. Yeah. Do you, I know you love the scratch board tool. Do you pretty much use that for Almost everything? 90% uh, of what I do is scratch board, unless I have a client that asks for another style. So I do have the guy that I do the movie posters for, um, they like uh, more of a, um, a um, sometimes they like an airbrush style. So I'll use the airbrushes. Sometimes they like a Drew Struzan style, uh, like the old 70s, no, no, the 70s, the old 80s uh, posters, um, you know, Indiana Jones and E.T. and all that stuff. He's done a million things. One of my favorite artists of all time, Drew Struzan. But um, if that's the case, I'll use colored pencils. Um, and I also use the blender. I use the Just Add Water blender a lot because once I lay these strokes down here, I'm going to want to, um, I'm going to want to kind of unify them a bit. And, uh, and that's, that's kind of what I use to do it. I love just add water and a scratch board tool. Yeah. It's really kind of like a knockout punch for me. Those are the ones I use the most. I'm not an artist though. <laughs> <laughs> looking really cool. Thanks. It's starting to get... Starting I'm to get, impressed that you can paint and talk and get this much done. Um, this is one of those ones where I knew I wouldn't have a lot of time. So, um, 
Golly, are we almost out of time already? You have 10 minutes. <laughs> Jeez. All right. Well, I'm not doing as well as I thought I was going to do. We should do another one of these so I can show the... Actually, you know what? Is there anywhere online I can post the finished piece? Because I'm going to want to finish this. That Like a, on the Corel thing, I can show the finished thing? Yes. Let's talk about that after. Okay. Yeah, I wanted to have more. All right, well, let me, let me since I'm getting super low on time here, let me flatten it and show you some more. I never have as much time as I think I'm going to have. It's always that way, Mike, but I, I think you're doing a fantastic job. Oh, Look, thank you, thank you. Great. All right, so, yeah, those, those streams that I do for uh, ZBrush are three hours. And at first I was really like, how am I going to talk and work for three hours at a time? But I managed to do, I think, almost 30 of them now. So those are all on my YouTube page. Jeremy is wondering if you use any special brushes to add light or to glaze over? Um, I used to use the uh, the FX glow brush in order to go in and make pieces that are illuminated. I still do from time to time. Um, but yeah, other than that and, you know, particle brushes from time to time, not too many special brushes. I find that I, I keep going back to the classics and and it just is, uh, things move faster for me. All right. So now what I'm gonna do, because I am seriously running out of time here, I'm just gonna block in some of this stuff really quickly. This guy slobbers a lot, by the way, so that's what's up with all this. Uh, uh. Okay, um, and then let's do that. All right, so now what I can do is I can turn off my line and take a look. It's looking pretty good. Um, what I do at this point is make sure I save and then go in and turn up the opacity on my line. And now I'm going to, I'm all about non-destructive layers. So I make a layer mask, set my color to black, and then I can go in and clean up by everywhere on this mask, everywhere that I put down black, it erases basically. But it it's still there. So if you're not using layer masks, um, I'm using the term erase. I'm painting out these things on the mask. But if there's something, like say I go too far, like, oh no, I just went too far, I just erased stuff that I want. Let's turn up the brush so it's a little more apparent. Oh no, I just messed up this part. I accidentally messed that up. I don't know if you noticed that. All right, it's set to black and I'm on the layer mask. If I set it to white, the color, and I paint back over it, everything is still there. I didn't lose anything. Thank goodness I had a layer mask right there to use. So anyway, yeah, no, I go set it back to black and I can go in and I just clean up. So there's a lot of going back and forth. You know, like I said, sometimes when I'm painting, I will go over the edge by mistake and I'll just change my color to white and I'll paint those parts back in. And I can get a super razor sharp edge for, you know, these toy things where they might want to put it on a different color background. So I can't have a painterly edge. I have to have it, you know, be really crisp. So this is how I do it. Jonathan is wondering when you do work in large formats, do you uh -huh. save less often or? No, you... not at all. The computer will crash. They don't, it doesn't care whether you're working in large format or not. So I constantly save, um, you know, just because you never, never know. 
Um, so yeah, it's it's a necessity. It doesn't matter what you're using; it's going to crash out on you at some point. And he's also wondering if you have a favorite self promotion method. Um, I'm doing better with uh, things like uh, social networking. So do a lot of posting on my Twitter, um, constantly posting on Facebook. That's pretty much all I use it for now is self-promotion. Uh, so, you know, go in there and, and talk about this stream today and I'll get people that come over from that. Uh, I'm getting better with hashtagging. That's another thing that's really important um, because you never know, like you can get people's attention with, uh, with hashtags more often than you would expect. So I used to have an agent back when I started and uh, I noticed that, um, you know, I was depending on him to get me the top dollar and new clients and things like that. And it really just wasn't happening. He had other people in his stable and he wasn't really doing what I wanted him to do. So I, rather than continuing to give away my 30%, I started doing it on my own. I started doing a lot more uh, promotion online and I actually got more clients. So that was a good thing. All right, so I turned this off. It's looking pretty clean. Now I can go in and start kind of just figuring it out on my own. At this point, what I would do is I would look at this and say, all right, some of these areas are good enough that I can hide the line and keep painting, right? So if I were to go, this is my line. Also, I didn't do this. I should have done it. I need to rename this and call this line because one thing that I do all the time, it doesn't matter how long I've been painting, is at some point I will start painting on the wrong layer. And when I do, it sucks. You know, I don't want to be painting on my line layer. Um, but anyway, when I have something that I like, I'll go up to the line layer. I'll make a layer mask for that as well. And if I'm happy with the way things are looking, I'll start painting out that line so I can get a better idea of what it looks like. And then I can paint in the details to those areas. So I kind of know that the mouth is where I want it to be, the shoulder, start painting this out, and then I can go over to the, uh, the layer that has a paint on it, make a new layer. See, this is when the layers start to pile up. But I'll make a new layer, and now comes the fun part. I can start painting in the clean details and you start to see it come together, right? This jaw part here, it's hard for me to see what's going on. So what I'll do now is I'll go up to the line layer, paint it out like that, and then go back to the layer that I'm painting on and I can start to detail that. I do my blending a lot rather than using a blender. Um, I like to use my color picker, uh, the eyedropper, and I will grab something that's right next to it and just go back and forth. Um, I also use the blender, but I like to do this when I want to keep those strokes. So just going back and forth. And starting to detail this. And then when I have something that I kind of like, what I can do is I can, um, let's go full black and just really define this edge. And then it really starts to pop, right? But when I find something that I like, I can make a new layer and then I'll go to my smudge tool, not my smudge tool, sorry, my um, soft blender. And I like to keep the opacity turned down pretty low, like 40%. And I can go in and I can start 
blending. It's set now for pickup underlying cover color. I use that all the time because, again, this is non-destructive. So I can go in and I can blend these colors, start to soften it up and make these things transition into one another. And once I do, I might look at it and say, you know what, I like it, but I kind of like the fact that there were brush strokes there. So I wish I had those back. And if that's the case, I'm on a layer where all I have to do is either erase away these things or uh, make another layer mask and I can just paint them out. And I have exactly what I want. So this is my workflow. I'm going to let everybody know where your website is. Now everybody wants to go and check you out. I find that nice. interesting because I try to include the information in the um, in our promotions. Uh -huh. But I always wonder if people go and look. Yeah. So. It's all good. Make sure if you want to see the more... I've been terrible about updating my website. I have a lot of stuff there, um, a lot of stuff. But the newer Marvel stuff is on my art station. So, oh, okay. Yeah, so make sure you give them the art station. And if you guys right. can, if you, if you like what I'm doing, I was just talking to Tanya about this earlier. If you can follow me on my Instagram, everything for me is at Mike T Artworks. But if you can follow me on my Instagram, that'd be great. Um, I noticed that... I get an awful lot more, um, even though I illustrate for a living and sculpt for fun, basically, um, I get a lot more likes on sculptures than I do on artwork, which is kind of puzzling to me. So I need more 2D fans on there. Give me a follow and I'll hit you back. I'll follow you back. But you see, I'm just going in now and smudging this and it's starting to look a little better. And then when you turn off the line, it really starts to come together here. Oops, see, I tried to paint on the wrong layer. The old painter would have let me do that and then I wouldn't even have known until I was done. Okay, I put both links for everybody in the questions panel and I'll also add those to the follow-up email that you all get that will link you to the recording. Um, I know people are busy and some of you showed up late, so this session is being recorded and takes a little while to process once we're done, but I will do a quick edit and throw it up on YouTube forward slash painter tutorials later today. Probably early evening, guys. Sometimes work gets in the way. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I know that we're pretty much out of time, but like uh, this, let me just save it real quick save and now I will get my pure ref um, let's see where did it go yeah oh, why is it not on top oh here it is yeah so basically when this is done it will look along these lines you'll be able to see strokes um, you'll be able to see, you know, it'll, it'll look painterly, but it will also um, feel much more detailed than this is right now. This is the starting stage where I would probably spend another, I don't know, 12, I don't know, 8, 12 hours on it. And by the time it's done, it's going to look super clean like this guy right here. So. Well, thank you so much, Mike. I wish you could see all the thanks and a lot of people saying that they learned a ton in the session and it was very awesome. entertaining. Thank, thank you. you. Awesome. I'm glad you guys liked it. Thank you for having me. Um, hope to show you some more stuff in the future. Let's do it. Cool. All right. Have a wonderful weekend, everybody. I hope you can get out and do something fun. <laughs> I guess it depends on where you live at this point. Yeah, yeah, wear a mask. <laughs> yep, wear a mask. All right. All right. Take care, everybody. Thanks so much, Mike. Thank you. Bye. Okay, bye.